Scott Lyons uh, from Leech Lake Ojibwe uh, Reservation in northern Minnesota. And I uh, came out here in 2002, and it's great to be back in Syracuse. Um, and uh, I just want to express my gratitude for being asked to speak tonight. It's an honor to share the stage with these two fine minds and to see such a, a great people that, I, that I've known, in addition to many people I don't know, in the audience. So uh, thank you. And I'd also like to say, or express my, my gratitude and appreciation and uh, admiration for this, this series, which is really remarkable, and I think makes Syracuse look very good. Uh, my dad was just here. Yeah. My dad was just here for the holiday, and I uh, was telling him about tonight and uh, what the series is about. And he still lives in Minnesota at Leech Lake, where um, uh, nothing like this uh, in my memory has ever happened. And uh, there's a lot of conflict between the native community and the non-native community um, in the border town and so on. Wrong. And uh, I was telling him about this series, and he listened, and, and he said, uh, do any white people go to that? <laughs> <laughs> so he was pretty impressed, too. What I'm basically going to do tonight is, um, I thought it was important just to talk about what this thing called sovereignty is. So uh, I thought I would uh, start by looking at the concept of sovereignty, which in an era of globalization, some people think is really becoming irrelevant. And to uh, look a little bit of, uh, at the history of this, of this concept. And then to look at the concept of tribal sovereignty uh, in particular, in, in the, in the uh, historical context of US political history. And then finally, I'd like to uh, finish up by um, considering some of the reasons why tribal sovereignty is indeed a very, very good thing for all of us. Sovereignty, as a concept per se, is an internationally recognized political concept whose most basic tenet is the power of the people to govern themselves. But the roots of the word have a religious character. As Vine Deloria Jr. once wrote, Sovereignty is an ancient idea once used to describe both the power and the arbitrary nature of the deity by peoples in the Near East. In other words, sovereignty belonged to God. Although originally a theological term, it was appropriated by European political thinkers in the centuries following the Reformation to characterize the person of the king as head of state. The king was thought to have uh, inherited his authority from God, which is why we have certain ideas like primogeniture or divine right. During the revolutionary era, sovereignty moved away from the church and the king, and eventually became the province of the nation, thus becoming linked to other concepts like democracy and citizenship. Now in this period, there were debates over the origins of sovereignty. Some people thought that it inherited the people that made up a nation. Others seemed to locate it in what they call the law of nations, or in, in nation. But both of these positions were attempts to ascertain the proper relationship between the rights and duties of citizens and the rights and duties of states. Sovereignty seemed to belong to nations, but was also seen as originating from, on the one hand, the people, or on the other hand, the character of the nation or nation. Now, as Joanne Barker has observed, the former assertion has defined the work of contemporary indigenous scholars and activists who have argued that sovereignty emanates from the unique identity and culture of peoples, and is therefore an inherent and an alienable right to the qualities customary, customarily associated with nations." Unquote. Now this is why it's so common for Native people to talk about things like culture and tradition and to use words like people and community when making claims to sovereignty. Sovereignty has not been, for most Native people, an abstract legal or theological in fact, some Native thinkers have recently tried to move away from this concept of sovereignty uh, in an effort to, to uh, rid themselves of some idealistic baggage or, or the, theo the theological baggage that they see linked to it. The Mohawk scholar Taiyaki Alfred has gone so far as to deem sovereignty an inappropriate concept because in his view, it has no relevance to indigenous values. Now, it's important to be clear about what Alfred is saying here. He's not arguing against Mohawk nation or uh, anything like that. But what he's doing is suggesting that European concepts and terms carry an implicit meaning to them that could be at odds with traditional Mohawk notions of leadership. So for Alfred, traditional indigenous nation that stands in sharp contrast to the dominant understanding of the state. There is no absolute authority in traditional Mohawk governance, no coercive enforcement of decisions, no hierarchy, 
and no separate ruling entity. For Alfred, the assumption of sovereignty by natives implies a kind of assimilation that he would like to resist. He does not want native communities to operate like non-native ones, not because they're non-native, but because he thinks that there's a problem with this idea of the state and of the hierarchy that inherited there. So he's encouraged other natives to search their languages for words that characterize politics in ways that we might, that sometimes translate to things like uh, taking care of ourselves. So this is what he's uh, been arguing, rather than using words like sovereignty. Now this said, he does admit that the pursuit of sovereignty has been an effective vehicle for indigenous critiques of the state's imposition of control, or more specifically, colonization. So it's a way to counteract that. So even for Alfred, sovereignty has its uses. But in the end, perhaps the best way to understand the meaning of sovereignty is to see it as the inherent right of peoples to govern themselves in their own ways, in their own communities, and without the undue interference or exploitation of outsiders in a global community of nations. It is an idealistic concept with theological roots, but its effects are always located in actual, material, day-to-day -day communities. So, what is tribal sovereignty? Tribal sovereignty is a phrase that generates a lot of heat, but it really means simply this, the recognition that American Indian tribal powers originate with the history of Native peoples managing their own affairs. And this recognition is located in several places. First, American case law has established that tribes reserve the rights they have never given away. Second, American Indian tribes possess a nation within a nation status, one that was originally form formulated through the process of treaty making. The treaties formalize a nation to nation relationship between the federal government and the tribes. In these treaties, Indians relinquish certain rights and lands in exchange for promises from the federal government, one of the most important being the trust relationship. Trust responsibility is a term that describes the government's obligation to honor the trust inherent to these promises and to represent the best interests of the tribes and their members. So the nations who treated with each other, Indians and the Americans, established a relationship based on trust legally, and that relationship continues today. Finally, even the U.S. Constitution recognizes Indian tribes as distinct governments. It authorizes Congress to regulate commerce with, quote, foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. That's three separate things, foreign nation states and tribes, which is a good thing, remember, the next time you hear someone say, but aren't we all just Americans? Because to the extent that the US Constitution means something, the answer is not exactly. In case law, in treaty history, and even the founding documents of the American Republic, it seems clear that Indian nations have been understood to be politically distinct from the American nation, although in very complex and sometimes paradoxical ways. Tribal sovereignty, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and the trust responsibility have all been challenged, and sometimes they have been changed over the years, beginning most notably with three 19th century Supreme Court opinions that continue to serve as a kind of cornerstone to understanding the sovereign status of Indian nations today. These cases, which are usually called the Cherokee Trilogy, and they were uh, presided over by uh, the famous uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, uh, are the most widely cited with uh, respect to tribal sovereignty, as we know. The first case, Johnson versus McIntosh, concerned the validity of a tribal land grant made to private individuals, and it provided that tribes' rights to sovereignty are impaired by colonization, but not disregarded. It further held that the federal government alone has the right to negotiate for American Indian land. The second Cherokee case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, with which uh, Richard has mentioned, involved an action brought against the state of Georgia by the Cherokee Nation, which sought relief from state jurisdiction on tribal lands. Chief Justice Marshall's decision described Indian tribes as domestic dependent nations, a phrase which is still in legal use today, and maintained that the federal tribal relationship quote, resembles that of a war to his guardian, which Richard mentioned. The final case of this trilogy, Wooster v. Georgia, concerned the application of Georgia state law within the Cherokee Nation. Marshall's decision there held that tribes do not lose their sovereign powers by becoming subject to the power of the U.S., maintained that only Congress has plenary power or a kind of overriding power to, uh, over Indian affairs, and established that state laws do not apply in 
Now, as Richard also pointed out, these three cases were a mixed bag for Native people, uh, not only because they were decided in a context of U.S. racism and imperialism, and we can see this in certain phrases or words like, like the whole uh, ward and guardian relationship, which is based on a kind of stereotype and image of an Indian inferiority, which is very commonplace at the time. But even more so because these cases simultaneously recognize indigenous sovereignty while also reducing it. They affirmed it while also attacking it, hence they were paradoxical. It is in these 19th century cases, in fact, where tribal sovereignty, I think, becomes very complicated, and, uh, and yet more legal revisionism would occur in the 20th century, which with uh, similarly mixed results. For example, in 1953, Congress modified the federal tribal relationship uh, in five states through the passage of Public Law 280. Public Law 280 provided for those states to assume general, criminal, and some civil jurisdiction over Indian reservations within the state. So the state police have jurisdiction. Just to get what Tribes retain limited criminal and general civil jurisdiction, but because of a lack of resources, have not been able generally, in most cases, to fully assume those responsibilities because of this, of this history. Public Law 280 was a revision of tribal sovereignty from the perspective of the colonizing power. And it must be understood, uh, well, not really as a reduction of sovereignty. After all, it didn't come from Indians, but as a reduction of sovereignty's recognition by Americans. But such was not always the case. It was not the only kind of revision to sovereignty that occurred during the 20th century. Another example is one that Richard also mentioned, the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978, which established procedures that state agencies and courts must follow in handling these Indian child custody cases. Uh, what that did is actually create a, a dual jurisdiction between states and tribes that defers heavily to tribal governments. This particular act is not the granting of tribal sovereignty, but rather an increased affirmation of such by the same power that also gave us Public Law 280. And this is really what we're talking about whenever we talk about federal Indian law and tribal sovereignty. The extent to which tribal sovereignty is recognized, not granted, not taken away, but recognized by the colonizing power. Remember, the definition of sovereignty finds it emanating from the people, a community who does things in their own way. As the history of federal Indian law reveals, Indians have been, for the most part, pretty consistent in trying to maintain tribal sovereignty. It is the Americans who have always had more power, uh, who have at various times wavered in their recognition of that. So if tribal sovereignty is a paradox, uh, it has these historical roots. And I do think it's a paradox today in some ways. So where does this leave us? Well, let's remind ourselves that so far this brief discussion of tribal sovereignty has focused exclusively on federal Indian law, meaning the law of a colonizing power. On that level alone, we can draw a number of conclusions about how the United States government understands tribal sovereignty. First, according to the U.S. and its institutions, Indian tribes remain sovereign nations and possess self-government. Second, tribes have a nation-to-nation -nation political relationship with the U.S. federal government and a nation-within-a-nation -nation political status. Third, only Congress has plenary power over Indian affairs and they must exercise it in definite terms, not by implication. And fourth, with some exceptions, state governance is generally not permitted within reservations. These four conclusions are very general and broad, and they refer to the U.S. as a whole. Uh, they're drawn from case law and, and, and political history. But these four conclusions are, once again, sovereignty as recognized by the American government. So it's a recognition, it's not an assertion. History, assertions. So what about the assertions of sovereignty? Well, indigenous people across the planet are in various ways asserting their inherent right to exist and govern themselves. Indigenism is a global movement, which Tanya will address, I'm sure. In this country, we see Indian assertions of tribal sovereignty. Anytime a heritage language program is started, a new school is established, or an old ceremony is revived. And yes, we also see Indian assertions of sovereignty in gaming compacts, smoke shops, and land claims. These are, in fact, assertions of economic sovereignty. And by their very existence, they attest the native recognition of the fact that in many ways, we are all related or connected through things like the economy. It is these assertions of economic sovereignty that seem to generate the most controversy today. 
nobody really complains when a new indigenous language program is started. But once we start talking about money, well, that's when the problems seem to emerge. So the question that has to be answered about these assertions of sovereignty by natives, and in particular the economic ones, is this. Why is tribal sovereignty good for all of us? It is an entirely fair question. I would like to conclude by suggesting two answers out of a possible many to that question. First, I submit that tribal sovereignty is good for all of us because it is a test of American democracy. And this is actually something that I think Felix Cohen was trying to get at in his quotation. To the extent that American citizens and their government recognize tribal sovereignty, I would suggest that American democracy is strong and just. And to the extent that it is not recognized, I would suggest that it is weakened. Now, this works on two levels, and the first is a simple question of minority rights. Every democracy can and should and is held to account regarding treatment of minorities. Uh, for the political philosopher Cornel West, this means using race as one barometer of democracy's quality in America. How, we must perpetually ask, has the American democracy treated racial minorities, including, but not limited to, American Indians? Does the United States honor its covenants with its minority citizens? Does it keep its word? Does it exploit minority resources like labor or land? Does it pay for what it takes? These are tough questions to ask of American history and also of the American president. But we must ask them because ultimately they are about democracy and the world is always watching to see how they are answered in the United States. But there's another claim that can be made regarding tribal sovereignty as a test of democracy. Namely, tribal sovereignty is at the very roots of American democracy. They helped establish America. And I'm not just talking about land, although there is certainly much to be said about land. Rather, I'm suggesting that without tribal sovereignty, there might not be a United States of America today. Now, to make this argument, let's go back to the founding of the American democracy in the 18th century, when the United States treated with Indian nations who had previously entered into treaties with other nations, the English, the Dutch, and so forth. Why did the Americans sign treaties with Indians, especially during times when they possessed military superiority? Because doing so was an assertion of American sovereignty at a time when this young nation was anything but secure in that or recognized by the world. That is, it was about gaining international recognition as a nation. During the early years of the Republic, there were basically two kinds of documents that made a nation a nation in the eyes of the world. One was a national constitution, which outlined the state and provided a basis for lawmaking. But the other kind of, the docu of document was the treaty, which signaled the recognition of other nations. Only nations make treaties. Nations do not exist when they're not recognized by other nations. Sovereignty was intersubjective. They had to, it was it was gained when, when sovereign entities recognized each other as such. So treaties with Indians, who themselves had to be recognized as nations in order for this process to work, uh, actually legitimized American claims to national sovereignty during that time in history. Once American national sovereignty was secure, in fact, around 1871, the United States passed the End of Treaty Making Act. Why then? Well, I would suggest because U.S. sovereignty was secure. And uh, that act, by the way, was a rider attached to an appropriations bill, and basically it did what it said it would do. It ended all treaty making. There were treaties made after that time, but they weren't legally called treaties, they had to be called agreements. This historical fact should provide an answer to the question, why is tribal sovereignty good for all of us? But here's the catch. These treaties have to be honored. And these legal precepts and all these definitions that have been produced in this history, like tribal sovereignty itself, should really mean something as a test of American democracy today. These things are not matters of morality or opinion, although they seem to be those things too. Really, they're basic political questions having to do with the foundations of America and the quality of its democracy. One last point I would like to close with, and this is another reason why I think tribal sovereignty is good for all of us. This one doesn't really have anything to do with the machinations of states and governments and the like. Tribal sovereignty, I would submit, is one way for common people to stand up 
It's no secret that major corporations are named as co-defendants in the Onondaga Land Rights Act. And they are there because they have polluted lands and waters that we all share. It's also no secret today that our government is a little cozier with large corporate powers than I think most of us are comfortable with. Wouldn't it be good if everyday people or a community with children and values that have more to do with the quality of life, less to do with profits, actually won a victory against large, impersonal, multinational corporations and their governmental bedfellows, who recognize no morality but that which the market dictates. This is precisely what I think the Onondaga Land Rights Action is about, using the law to fight mammon in the name of protecting children who are here and not yet born. And I think that we're all invested in its outcome. However, If you visit so-called anti-sovereignty websites, or better yet, attend one of the readings, what you find there is basically this. A membership that is by and large working class, yet under the leadership of people who are by and large well-educated and economically privileged. And these groups, led by, uh, uh, or made up in this way, are devoted to destroying tribal sovereignty.